We are going to discuss why stem cells are so controversial and how the controversy started in history and where it's at now. They had to get ahead of the narrative before the science of using your cells to help you heal got kind of out of control. So when they got the narrative out there that stem cells are bad, yeah. it has fetal tissue, and, you can, and, and they're killing babies to do this, they kind of won. This is everything that's come out of the mommy after the baby on a C-section in unvaccinated tissue. Pairing a patient's injury is profitable. Healing a patient is not profitable. Not for the system. Welcome to the Zero Downside Podcast with Dr. Wade McKenna, sponsored by MoabTexas.com. Welcome, guys, to another episode of The Zero Downside. I am Hannah Dunning, here with Mike Mitchell. Good morning. Hello, hello. Yes, it is early this morning we're in here, huh? It is. Yes. It's a little early. So, hey, I, I wanted to just start off. Um, how was the weekend? It was relaxing. Yeah? I did nothing but binge watch Marvel Universe and lay with my dogs and it was wonderful how about you and, well you know got to hang out with the kids spend some time with them it's it's been a bit and helping a bunch of our guys at the jujitsu studio prep for a competition next weekend we're really excited um hey dr mckenna what what did you do uh this last weekend oh, oh no yeah. i hung out with the kids a little bit yeah yeah nice relaxing tore down some goalposts <laughs> You're not the field. You're not referring to a football game, are you? I, there might have been a game played on Saturday. This is shameful. Old school Barry Sanders. It's literally the Sanders name on the back. And these are the official Bedlam shoes, the Yeezy Boosts um, with the bright orange. These were on the field when the goalpost came down. I have pictures of me and all the girls kissing the field, holding the goalpost. Uh, it was it was just another just another random go pokes weekend for us. That's um, there is a uh, you know battle of Oklahoma that there's a trophy that goes to the winner, and since this is the last time that game's going to be played, that trophy is going to perpetually set in Stillwater now. So not not just another random weekend. I think you're happier than Gundy. I I will tell you that I'm I'm happy. Like I'm such a Gundy apologist anyway. I know right? because. Because he's brought our program to a level that every time someone starts to criticize again, I'm always like, oh. Now, I admit, there was a point after this game last year where there was a couple of the staff members uh, that had to do with the offense that I might have just left in Norman and told them they need to find their own way back. But not after this weekend. I mean, yeah, totally pretty, redeemed, right? Pretty good weekend for, for the McKenna family and for the Polk family and for anyone that bleeds orange. For sure, and the so, daughters got to go on the field. They did. Um, it was it was pretty. This, and actually, this is the second time that they got to be on the field after a, a big OU win. Um, my oldest and I um, were on the field uh, before the youngest one was born uh, on the 2011 season, um, after one of our you know best seasons ever. Um, so, and the goalpost came down then too. So, I've been on the field twice when the goalposts come down in the history of our school. And, both times were after beating that other school in Oklahoma. You know, I've got a few nice friends that go to Oklahoma State and they're alums as well, or they went to Oklahoma State rather, and I was getting texts and pictures throughout the game from you, from them, from everybody else. And there's one picture of this white-haired guy right <laughs> underneath the goalposts, and he happens to be helping people. Boosting them up. Yeah, boosting I mean, we, them were, up. We, were, we were the pyramid for the boost to the post. And then this, this, someone tased these kids off and that did not go well. And yeah. and then then they decided to give it up. They were taking it pretty serious in the beginning, but there came a point where, you know, the, it was it's gonna happen. it was gonna happen. Yeah. Just just move out of the way. Try to keep people safe and 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 know that this is a historic celebration. So well, congratulations to you and all your fellow. Pups. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take this off just so that I don't have to irritate a significant subset of the popular. But I think that that probably a lot of people were rooting for Oklahoma State this last weekend. Awesome. Um, um, and and we had we had we had obviously had a great weekend. Well that is super awesome. Congratulations, Dr. McKenna. <laughs> yeah, this is so. this is the Beyonce wardrobe change <laughs> happening right now while Hannah's gonna talk and lead us uh. in. 
So today, <laughs> our topic today is we are going to discuss why stem cells are so controversial and how the controversy started in history and where it's at now and break down a little of the science that explains how it may have gotten misconstrued throughout the process. So I'm going to leave it in the hands of the expert and go ahead and let him have the floor. I, I, I love the way you said that because I think that the way it got to be controversial wasn't an accident, I don't think. I mean, if you look back at when the narrative against this tissue, the use of tissue graph started, it started because, and, and, and look, we all know that marketing people, as you've taught me, are incredibly good at forming the narrative. And it's really hard when you have a lot of money and you form the narrative, it literally gets set up as almost like fact. And people just assume that because you constructed this narrative, that that's the facts of the situation. And that's because the medical industry as a whole, and in particular, I think Big Pharma, realized very early on that cell therapy was the way the human body works and they had to get ahead of the narrative before the science of using your cells to help you heal got kind of out of control um, they had to get ahead of it and create this huge negative image of and connect it to something that is very emotional provocative and connected it to abortions and fetal tissue and that's never been true. The, the fetal tissue graph, we would never use in the orthopedic applications or regenerative applications because those cells want to form a baby and we either need to go upline or downline with those tissues to be able to help you be better. But they got ahead of that narrative and everyone knows, like if you watch a commercial, you you'll hear it you'll see people dancing and they oh my i've got my life back would mike even use the example was it just a parag paragliding yeah i need to go and get a disease so that i can go paragliding I can go again. paragliding yeah. and i'm going to dance with my friends and oh, i'm going on vacation and i'm at the farmer's market picking out fruit and and, and they're talking about the drug what does the drug have to do with any of that and at the very last of the ad it says may cause serious diarrhea <laughs> headaches you know loose stools cramping and abdominal pain like you could die from tuberculosis please don't take this drug if you've had any other viral illness you may be more susceptible to diabetes cancer but, but paragliding but, but, in the beginning, <laughs> but all you remember is wow that lady was dancing and singing yeah. and and th that's that's how well they control the narrative on that drug they, they don't talk about the fact that i mean there's a there's a cholesterol drug out there that we that we have to take a lot of people off of because it causes serious abdominal cramping and headaches and dramatic fatigue. People go on this drug for their cholesterol and they can't even get out of bed for a week. And they're like, well, it's not that, right? It's got, oh my God, like, no, it's that, right? So, but they, but, and that's in the ad, but that's not what you see about the ad. You say, oh, you're going to live longer. There's no proof that, of that. The, oh, well, if you control your LDL, there's, there's no proof that that makes you live on, right? Like, but that's how good they've got the narrative. And, and we talked to a little pre-production and there's a really, there's a significant old joke where, and I'm, this is going to be a little inappropriate maybe, but this little boy comes to his mom at the grocery store and he has a bottle that has Tampax on it and, and puts it in the cart. And his mom goes, sweetie, what are you doing? She goes, he goes, well, I want these. And she says, why? He goes, well, in the commercials, it says you can ride horses and go swimming. Like, that was the, what he got from the commercial. Didn't even know what it was used for. And that's what most people get from big drug company commercials. So when they got the narrative out there that stem cells are bad, yeah. it has fetal tissue, and, you can, and, and they're killing babies to do this, they kind of won, right? Because there's still sites. There's, there's a troll out there. There's a lot. Of, here's what you need to know. When someone's trolling on cells, there's not. What is the motivation to talk bad about certain forms of science? Like, especially when you connect it to things that aren't true, where you're trying to paint a negative narrative. Well, who do those people probably work for? Who do you think they work for? 
right? Who sponsors one of these kids out there, you know, talking about fetal tissue and it can contaminate and there's de- Well, it's not he- just a kid. It's, they, they qualified themselves online, of course, yeah. right? But, but yeah, but he's a <clears throat> PhD student. Yes. Who's never had a real, oh, but you know who's, who, you know what, what PhD program is funded by? Big Pharma. You know who's controlling the research grant that he's under? Big Pharma. Well, no wonder he's talking about, about something that's not, if we made the point, if this was a drug, it'd be fine. Mm-hmm. We, no one, we, there wouldn't be this big narrative against it. If it was a drug made from fetal tissue, it'd be fine because they wouldn't talk about it early on against cell therapy because it was a, who was looked upon as a conservative president, but still got his money from the same place and the same part, you know, it bothers me a lot when people say Republicans and Democrats, whatever, this isn't a political narrative, right? They turned it into a political narrative, but there shouldn't be politics involved in science. Like politics is about consensus. Science is about being right and, and absolutes. And science should never be about the political consensus. Well, the consensus is you should, that probably means you're wrong, right? Science is about, about being to prove that you're right, not about does everyone agree with me or not. Politics is about consensus. And the politics behind this were because the drug companies got the narrative that they were paying for. And it's really hard to run for an office that pays $400,000 a year when you have to spend $200 million to get that. I, I don't even know why you would spend half a billion dollars for a job that pays four hundred thousand dollars a year well i mean i i think i probably do now but i didn't then yeah. and i believed the narrative i was a good little conservative boy and grew up in church and and sunday morning sunday night and wednesday night like i know what dish to bring on a wednesday night right <laughs> um i know that that you got to get your own casserole <clears throat> pan back um that's the way i that's that's the way all of us grew up um and so for me to find out later, because I didn't understand in the 80s when that narrative was being pushed, I would have been against it too. Oh, killing babies. I think, the, the, whoa, they use fetal tissue. But but that's not it. But that's still, because they tainted it so early on, you're still fighting against that belief. Does it have anything to do with what we do in the clinic? Absolutely not. Has it ever had anything to do with what's being done? No. Did it have to do with even the research on what we're doing? No. Does it have to do with the research in cosmetics? Yeah. Does it have to do with the research in a lot of the vaccinations? Yeah. Would I participate in that type of a research program? No. Do we, is that what we're doing with amnion postnatal tissue graph? No. This is everything that's come out of the mommy after the baby on a C-section in unvaccinated tissue, right? And the bone marrow narrative I still, like you just said, why is it still controversial? If you would have told me in the early 2000s, when we were late 90s, when we were pioneering the use of concentrated bone marrow aspirate concentrate for non-union fractures to augment spinal fusions, um, small joint fusions that have a significant failure rate to get rid of surgical infections like osteomyelitic infections, when you could take concentrated bone marrow and treat those things, If you would have told me 20 years from now, you're still going to be fighting against this narrative, I might have quit, right? Because it it doesn't pay you to do it. Like when we take a patient to surgery and I take their bone marrow and I inject it into their rotator cuff at the time of surgery to help them heal because the difference in failure is dramatic. The patients that have bone marrow at the time of the rotator cuff tear, six months, what's published, 100% were healed. The ones that didn't, only 67% were healed. So there's like a 30% failure rate in those cuffs without marrow, 0% failure rate with. The 10-year follow-up was published. That was published in like 05. The 10-year follow-up was published in 2014. So almost a decade ago, we had decade follow-up on that group of patients. Mm -hmm. And the ones without marrow, only 40% were still intact. The ones with marrow, 87% were still intact. So the 10-year follow-up was better than the six-month follow-up after traditional rotator cuff surgery. Why doesn't everyone do that? You know why? Because you don't pay, you don't get paid to do it. When I take someone in the OR and I take the bone marrow and it takes 10 minutes to, you know, cause we can't, I can't take the marrow in the same position that they're prepped for surgery on their shoulder. So then we have to, I have to prep that, take the marrow, 
put a stitch in it, set them up, hand the bone marrow off the field. A tech has to spin that marrow down in the machine. They can create bone marrow spot concentrate. We set the patient up and we get the rotator cuff repret, redrape and start. It, it delays my surgery. 15 minutes? Uh, at, yeah, at least probably yeah. because you have to redrape and stuff. Mm -hmm. But but if I, but people are like, oh, well, you get reimbursed for that. No, no. Yeah. We don't get reimbursed for the, you know what I get? You know why I do it? Because it works. Yeah. Because I don't have infections in, in, in the rotator. It, look, the, the traditional infection rate in orthopedics and rotator cuff is three to five percent. The infection rate with marrow in, in, in our patients is we haven't had a surgical IND on a shoulder in in decade. Well, I think you've said it before. Repairing a patient's injury is profitable. Healing a patient is not profitable. Not for the system. Yeah. Right. It, it is. It. But it's certainly where my self esteem comes from. Like I, I have serious self loathing. Right. Like I know that my, you know, my personal life, my, the bills getting paid, the business part, you just kind of throw them up in the air and see where things land. But I'm on point with what we do and my focus on what's the best thing I can do to help a patient get the best result. And marrow aspirate is the only way I can get a tendon to remodel and heal on a, on a reliable basis. And so when we talk about why are stem cells controversial, whew, 20, the papers published to show that you can, especially spinal fusion. The mm -hmm. spinal fusion data is a big deal because there's a lot of failures and it's a big surgery. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Back pain is a serious uh, problem from an economic standpoint, from a work comp, from reimbursement, from for a patient to be off work. And then if you add that you have all the surgery and it didn't heal, or you have all the surgery and it, and it got infected, we should, as a physician community, as a scientific community, look and try to find any ways we could lower the complication of those surgeries from a non-union or from an infection standpoint. And they did all that research. And guess what? Guess what came about? Bone marrow aspirate concentrate. It dramatically changed the fusion data as far as success rate. You could use less bioavailable grafts and still get way better fusion rates than even taking the rib hump off in scoliosis where they cut ribs. And, and you know, if you cut childhood ribs when you're doing a scully fusion, when you cut that rib out and you, you morselize it, put it in there. I mean, we used to laugh that with kid rib for a fusion on their back, you can almost watch it form bone. <laughs> but, and there's a study out of Delaware, which in Wilmington is one of the big pediatric spine hospitals, especially when I trained, um, that they did a rib graph on one side and bone marrow aspirate with calcium, with a, with a crummy inert bone graft on the other, the fusion rate was the same. And the side with the bone marrow aspirate healed faster. That's all, that's, that should have been the drop the mic. You just need to use bone marrow aspirate if you're doing a spine fusion, because you're going to help form bone easier. And we've had the conversation before that in the beginning with stem cells, especially from bone marrow aspirate concentrate. I used to think, and so did everyone else, not just me, but I mean, we've come a long way that that those cells were only capable of really forming bone. So when you put it in like a non-union of a tibia fracture, which has been published for a long time, complicated tibia fracture, there's a non-union rate of around 11% on those injuries. And that's a lot of those that you do all this work and they don't heal. You could turn that rate to about zero just by taking bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And when you're repairing that, you inject the tibia. And that was published out of Israel in the late nineties, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. But we would worry that if those cells leaked out, you might form bone into the, the soft tissue and that would be bad. Like heterotopic ossification is the formation of bone we don't. So they were controversial because we didn't understand them at the time, but we knew it made a big difference. Now, the, none of that's true. Like I don't worry about, I don't wrap a membrane around a fracture to make sure the marrow doesn't leak out because when the marrow leaks out, you know what it does? It makes the surrounding soft tissue healthier. Does those cells becoming bone make the fracture heal? No, that's not how it works. Now we know that those cells provoke microangiogenesis more vascularity around the fracture that's the reason it healed the, anyone that starts the lecture and we have we, said this a bunch of times i hope it finds a home eventually that when you go to a stem cell lecture you hear someone talk about stem cell if they start out with this one cell becomes these five types get up and walk out like that's not that's not how it works right how it works it in the lab can i make the can those cells become those sure the cell is pluripotent it can become any of those cells how it works when, when we take your bone marrow and put it back in someone where we, where we need it, is it secretes everything you need to help that area heal. If I take those same cells and stick them in the middle of a bad Achilles tendon that's all scarred in and hasn't healed and has had three surgeries, it doesn't make bone grow into that tendon. 
Matter of fact, if bone is grown into that tendon from the surgical stimulation, you can help the bone resorb in that tendon and get the tendon to remodel. It's been really well published. One of us in this room published that at the first time in like 2014. <laughs> Right? It wasn't me. It it definitely was not me. I, I don't know. I think my name might be on top of that paper. But, and then, then what we didn't even know, that paper got published before we even had a, like 11 week follow up when someone that had a 10 year old problem that had never had been successful with just with the injection of cells, the tendon completely started to remodel. They went from not even being able to walk on cobblestone street to playing tennis again at like six, eight weeks. By 11 weeks on MRI, it was healed. It was 80% normal tissue homogeneity, and we published the paper. That same patient in follow-up at 32 weeks, because they said, you know, my bump is completely gone. And I was like, what? They said, my bump. And I'm like, no. Like, yeah, so I'm, you know, examining it. And under the table, much of my daughter. I was going to say, you have yeah. to describe where yeah, the examination took place. So, yeah, so it was a, it was a yeah, tennis player. Yeah, the accent just came out of nowhere. And, <laughs> and, um, that, and my daughter was a tennis player, and she didn't get to meet her. And so when she was back in town, you know, we all went to lunch. And it was like 32 weeks out. We'd already, we'd, we'd already got the paper accepted for publication. And when she said that, it never occurred. It was, what was never a part of our hypothesis is that if we put those cells in, we thought we could, we thought we were taking this big dra dramatic avascular scar. And we thought by repopulate, because when you biopsy that tendon under a microscope, there's no nuclei anywhere. And you know, a cell has a nucleus. So if there's no nuclei, it just means it's all this dead stromal tissue. That's the reason it hurts. It doesn't have a blood supply, it gets inflamed. When we take cells and we inject into that area, we're kind of repopulating this dead tendon. And those cells secrete peptides and proteins and the scar kind of doesn't so dry it out. It's not so painful. It gets rid of the inflammation and it doesn't hurt anymore. What I, what was never part of my hypothesis then that is now is at 32 weeks on MRI that we begged to get both of those at the time. And she said, Oh, I, I, that'd be lovely. Um, is we redid MRIs of both those tendons. And the non-injured tendon was 2.4 centimeters around. The injured tendon was 12.9 centimeters around when we injected it. At 32 weeks, it was 2.4 centimeters around. I didn't tell the cells how big to make the tendon. They knew, right? Your body has the ability to heal and remodel that if you give it what it needed. Because this was a 59-year-old female, it was stuck in this negative feedback loop of inflammatory and scar. Body did the best it could. It wasn't on its list of priorities and it scarred it in thinking that'd be fine. Well, it's not fine if you wanna play tennis. It was fine if you wanna stay bipedal, right? I wanna walk on two feet, I wanna stay. You can just keep mobility, which is what the body was trying to do. It didn't want to heal it the way it would have if you were a kid, but it was possible. And we didn't know that. So the tendon completely remodeled because the cells knew how big to make it. When you, when I operate on an Achilles, I always try to make, I don't leave some big header. I don't make it this giant big wad of stuff back there. You try to make it about the same size as the other side, mm -hmm. but it doesn't stay that way. If you don't use marrow, it either hypertrophies when you do a surgery and you get a little bit of scar tissue and it gets bigger or it atrophies when you do surgery and it kind of shrinks down a little bit from where you sewed it in, but it never stays the same size. It has to heal, and with healing, there's a little bit of remodeling, either scarring in or, or taking some away. Not if you use the cells. It, it, I, I, can, I try to make it the right size, you make it fit, and then when you inject your, because if I do a repair, I always inject it. When you do that, it heals, it doesn't just scar in and remodels. And that's been published for a decade, right? Now we kind of understand that. So when someone says, why are stem cells so controversial? Man, if I was having a, an Achilles tendon, if I was having a rotator cuff, if I'm having lateral condylitis, if I'm having a fusion, if I'm having a, a non-union fracture, if I have a complicated fracture pattern, there's zero reason for it to be controversial. You know why? Because those have all been published for up to 20 years in the data. When someone says, well, he's using, I love the trolls on, on the, the webpage or the, 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 the Reddit the, the or, podcast or whatever, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, even, you know, because now Hannah's got the, we have a TikTok and we have a, an Instagram and I still don't have Facebook, but we do have a, a YouTube channel with the Zero Downside podcast. And you'll see some trolling. Oh, this guy's using non-approved tissue graph in an unapproved fashion without any data out there. 
There are over 6,500 papers published using the machine we use to concentrate bone marrow aspirate. And you know what? There's no paper published showing an adverse reaction. Uh, uh, there's no paper published that didn't lower the infection rate in the, in the treated group to the non-treated group. And there, there's one paper published where it didn't change the healing, but they, but I don't even know what the goal of their paper was. They were doing a total knee and injected stem cells in the gutter to see if it changed the range of motion healing. How is it supposed to do that exactly? Yeah. When we do a total knee, I do inject stem cells in the quad repair. You know why? Because my goal is to make the quad repair heal faster and lower the anterior knee pain associated with total knee. Because the quad tendon is just like the Achilles and that when you, you can poke a knee, when you open that up, and you've seen a ton of these, yes. you can poke holes in the quad tendon. It won't bleed. Because it doesn't, but if it doesn't bleed, guess what it also doesn't want to do? Heal. Heal, yeah. yeah. You know what you have to do, have to heal? Blood supply. Yeah. You know what tendon doesn't have very well? Blood supply. So when you open that quad tendon up, and we're cutting right through it to be able to replace your knee. If I do that, and I'm going to sew it back together, and it scars in, guess what we just talked about it can be really painful? It's the scar. So people get a lot of anterior knee pain, and an anterior knee pain syndrome after a joint replacement is a thing. If you take cells and we inject that quad tendon across, across our repair before I close everything up, guess what happens? It heals. You don't get a lot of anterior knee pain. That's been published for a long time. But if you just stuck cells in the gutter of your knee, I don't even know what it's supposed to do. So that paper, there is a paper that showed it didn't make much of a difference. I don't, you, like, I don't know what you were looking for to make the gutters don't heal. It's not involved in the process. And that's where you put the cells. I don't know what your goal was, right? But I know that there's 6,500 papers published that if you had a definitive goal, you were able to meet it. And that and that statistic, from six, that, that's from a few years ago. Like there's more, but these papers start in the late 90s. So when it comes to so, the Achilles and when it comes to the knee and the repairs and the healing that you're talking about, is this a resource issue? Is it just the fact that my body can't produce enough of something in order to, to heal and, and get the result that you're looking for? Or is it just you're, you're having to train something? You know, what, what is it that's, that's affecting that process? So when, when then I love this part of the science behind what we do, because I've literally been giving a stem cell talk on the, the clinical uses of bone marrow aspirate. And I keep running across these because I look so bad. So now when we go in the YouTube search and we're trying to find stuff and see how we're doing, um, these like there's a there's a lecture from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons in like 2012, <clears throat> and and you know I look 20 years older than I do now, um, and I'm talking and and literally one of the orthopedic surgeons that I like and respect is in the front row you know at a table near the front with a bunch of his residents. He goes, "Oh, stem cells! I don't believe in stem cells." And I literally stopped and said, "Wait a minute, I I can hear you, right?" And, and I said, so when you say you don't believe in stem cells, are you saying that it doesn't exist? Or are you saying you don't think it could work? Are you saying that there's this big tissue that is in the human body that is the basis of the formation of all the other tissue that you don't believe in healing? Like, I don't, when you say you don't believe in stem cells, what I need to know is what do you think it is that helps you heal when you cut someone? Like you're a surgeon. If you open someone up and you sew it together, did the suture make it heal? No, suture's inert. It doesn't make you heal. Did the, did the tendon magically sew itself together? No, it didn't. There's no magic, right? It's physiology. This is how the human body works. So what is the cell? that helps you heal. That's the, what's the first stage of wound healing when I do that? Well, there's this inflammatory reaction. And so you see the, okay, no, no, no. What's the cell that secretes the PGE2 that starts the microangiogenic process that sends the cells to that area? It's a stem cell. It's your stem cells. It's, provoc it's provocative from the capillary bed, which is a really good place for stem cells to be. And so if the stem cells in the capillary bed are stimulated, begin the secretion of PE, PGE2 and, and CD34, the hemopoietic stem cell, secretes all this PGE2, and you see this inflammatory reaction, and then you get remodeling of tissue, it's the secretion of WENT4, it's the secretion of, of there's all these peptides and proteins, 7,000 of them, secreted by these cells and controlled that initiate the phases of healing. 
So when someone says, I don't believe that stem cells are controversial, no, they're not. The, the business of stem cell has become controversial, but stem cells and what they do in the human body is not controversial at all. It's, it's, and we know how to get them to do it. But as to your point, mm -hmm. you use up 90% of the stem cell volume you're ever going to have just to become an adult. So children, so when we talk about cartilage growth, that's the easiest one. I am a, I'm a big guy. What's your saying all the time about size? Do something to do something. Right. So if you're a jujitsu guy yeah. and some guys at 120 pounds, is he going to throw around a 250 pounds? He's going to have a tough day. Might, might be a rough time, right? Yeah. Two something to do something. That's my favorite. I was three something, right? I don't and, have a and, fun phrase for three something. Yeah, three I'm something just telling to you, I was three less. something in the beginning because I wanted to be, right? Like I, I liked, I mean, I was a big kid. I was a big guy. Yeah. Do, do, do I, does my knee in my size, I'm six, four and now about, you know, two ten, not three ten. but does my knee now have more cartilage than it did when I was six months old? Yeah. yeah. My knee when I was six months old was about that big. So the cartilage covering the bone is the most important part, not the little meniscal cartilages. Those are important. Certainly we know the physics behind all that. But bone, the, the cartilage, cover, like when you pull apart a chicken, like that shiny covering, when we talk about cartilage growth, that's what we're talking about. Because as long as you have cartilage, you have less pain. The arthritis, which I hate that term, it's just a junk term. It just means, it, it can mean anything. But what it's supposed to mean if we talk about chondromalacia, which is disease of the articular cartilage, and there's grade one chondromalacia, grade four chondromalacia, there's no such thing as grade five. Grade four means areas of bare bone. If you have chondro, grade four chondromalacia, you have arthritis, degenerative joint disease. It's because you don't have all that nice shiny covering on your bone. Did How much of that did I have if my knee was this big? And how much of that do I have now? Or, or say not now, because now I have less. But do, do I don't have less than I did when I was a kid, but I certainly have less than I did when I was 30, yeah. right? So if you compare the cartilage volume I need when I was 30 to the cartilage volume I need when I was six months old, what caused all that cartilage to grow? Okay, come on, class. We all know now, right? Like, I don't go think he's covered. Like, it's the stem uh, cell, right? A uh, stem cell? Yeah, there, there you go, right? <laughs> so what provoked the cartilage? Did the cartilage just know how big it would to get? Maybe, right? Because the human body is really good. Now, all the work we do in orthopedics and all the degenerative joint disease stuff and all the joint replacements we do are people that don't have enough cartilage in their knee. Did the something physiologic change in you while you're turning from a child to an adult where you're growing all this cartilage and it just turns into this great big knee with lots of cartilage in it? What, what changed? Your cellular volume and the ability of those cells, they, they, their, their beginning purpose is to turn you into an adult. That's the same cell that later becomes your only way to repair things and try to keep healthy and control your immune system and control tissue growth and regeneration and lower your inflammatory load. That's the only three purposes of a stem cell. This is the cells that do that. The immune modulation part of it, crucially important. There's great studies out there showing graft first host disease, mm -hmm. which means you have a surgery where they used this graft and you react abnormally to it and you're going to die. And it's a bone marrow transfer graft. But what's the treatment for that? Stem cells. Is the stem cell treatment for that life-saving compared to steroids? Yes. And there's a drug made from adult stem cells from bone marrow that is approved to treat graft-first host disease. But it's a drug, and so it's fine. I feel like I'm getting the conclusion that you're drawing here. <clears throat> so the best use of stem cells as a drug you can treat graft first host disease way better than corticosteroids or any other drug on the market to prevent graft rejection. But it's against law to talk about it as a stem cell, but it's not against the law to talk about it when it's a drug, right? So when you say, I don't believe in stem cells or stem cells are controversial, is it controversial to think a little kid knee becomes an adult knee? No. What's the cell that does that? Your stem cells participate in all the growth of the human body. Now, the problem is, as a child, 
your stem cells and all the way up into late adolescence double of one cell becomes two about every 24 hours. Okay. As an adult at 60, and we'll use some round numbers at 60 in round numbers, one cell becomes two around every 60 hours. Doesn't sound like a big difference. Wait a minute. Adult cartilage still grows. Yes. Cartilage never stops growing. It slows down because your body has other things it needs to do. You don't need to continue to grow a lot of cartilage. You have enough. When growth plates close, most people have enough cartilage to make it through most of life. Do we have enough cartilage to make it through most of life with injuries or playing a lot of ball or, or, or jujitsu or people or runners? Maybe not, right? And so we have to help that person heal that area. And we would like to help that person heal that area and not just stick a scope in there and wash it out. I would like to stick a scope because the scope does not grow cartilage. It actually does the opposite according that. to what we've a talked about. The scope does not grow cartilage. Yeah. It does the opposite because what's published after arthroscopy at six months without set, without bone marrow is everyone has less cartilage than they did before their scope because you get some scarring, you get some remodeling, it kind of pulls back and it's not on, you're trying to get rid of an inflammatory load and you're cleaning edges up, but you may not, you're not going to get any cartilage, dramatic cartilage growth because you're provoking some healing but you're not provoking cartilaginous growth. How do you get cartilage growth after a knee scope? While you're asleep, you fill that knee with the cells of bone marrow so that it can provoke, it's a sentinel cell, it's an organ. It can provoke, it senses that there's an inflammatory change. It senses that the cartilage is, is injured and it helps those cells do a better job of healing. If you're gonna be able to grow cartilage after that, these are the cells that will help you do it. And, and, and we know that because there's good data published on microfracture which is a terrible surgery, but it did cause healing compared to people that didn't. And the goal with microfracture was you poke holes in the knee through the scope and a little bit of marrow leaked into it. Yeah. Well, if a little bit of marrow could provoke healing, what could the, and, and, and some of that's just fat and a lot of it's white cells. <clears throat> and so, but the, the, the pluripotential cell that's provoked to heal in that response can, can help seal that over with cartilage. But what would, if a little bit of drop from that fracture site does that in a knee, what would the concentrated metabolic equivalent of 60 cc's of those cells do? When you concentrate it, get rid of the white cells that cause inflammation, get rid of all the fat because it gets in the way, get rid of a lot of the red cells because they're just noise. And you take that graft and you put that in the knee at the time of an knee arthroscopy. Is that gonna help you heal cartilage? Yeah, because that's how the body does it, right? So why are stem cells controversial? I, look, I think we can go down. Stem cells are not controversial. Stem cells are the way you heal. Stem cells are this. Now, stem cell science, some stem cell research, the business model of stem cells, I think a lot of that's controversial. Mm -hmm. Cell doubling time. A child, one cell becomes two around every 24 hours. And at 60, one cell becomes two around every 60 hours because it's not as prolific at its cell doubling time. What's that difference? Does that sound important? Yeah, because if one cell becomes two every 60 hours, at the end of the month, you have 200 cells. If one cell becomes two every 24 hours, how many do you have at the end of a month? A billion. A billion's way better than 200, right? I mean, even Einstein, they, which I'm, I'm born on the same day as Albert Einstein, um, Pi Day, 314, right? So, so, so I might have, been fascinated by that coincidence and studied a lot about Albert Einstein. And there was one time in Albert Einstein's life and it's in, in his autobiography where they asked him, what's the most amazing mathematical equation? Because we're talking about the guy that is now being proven right by, by, by a space tel telescope, right on the formation of universes, by the way time works, but with, with, with the theory of relativity, right? Like Einstein was that. And they asked him, what's the most amazing mathematical formula ever had, you've ever been associated or seen? And you know what he said? Mm -hmm. You know the story? Compound interest, right? Because that was the only way to wealth, right? I mean, like, so even Einstein knew, like, if I can put money here and leave it alone for 20 years and it compounds at 7%, like $5,000 over 20 years at 7% is a million dollars. Just put, put it in account and say, that's, that's the way stem cells work too, right? And so for me, those cells and to still be talking about controversy when we're talking about the foundation of orthopedics and healing is really bothersome. 
Well, what would happen if you use bone marrow aspirate concentrate stem cells and amniotic stem cells at the time of a scope? Okay. But like what? How did? How would that change the game? And why? Why wouldn't you why be would we allowed that? it yeah. to do it as well? Okay. Uh, th I, th this is where things get really cool, right? So, from a science perspective, here's what happens to adult bone marrow: those cells get kind of lazy. Not lazy, but they're you have less of them, and guess what they want to do they want to help you through emergencies and crisis you have a heart attack or stroke you have a big hip fracture you have you, you have more of those cells in circulating bloodstream but do they want to do that no are they just circulating around looking for something to heal no because you don't have as many as you used to have and they can't do as much as they used to do and they don't double as easy as they used to right so what we have to do is take those cells and kind of put concentrate them and kind of put them where they go to help you get that area on your priority list. With amnion, and we're talking about postnatal tissue graft, right? We're talking about the umbilical cord and we're talking about the placental tissue. That is only from a C-section delivery because if it's clotted, if you deliver a baby through it, it's all clotted up and those cells, the platelet cell activation, and you're not going to see a lot of those cells. Um, if it's disease tissue, if mommy has a disease, if they've been vaccinated, you can't use all that. We don't use that tissue. Um, there are plenty of tissue graphs that if they can't tell you it's non-vaccinated tissue graph, I probably wouldn't use it right now. Um, I think that, that that's a big deal in the cellular science, but amnion is uniquely capable because it's immune privilege, right? So one of the questions you get all the time is is about having adverse reactions to the amniotic tissue. So there are people are worried about an allergy, right? Mm -hmm. The the amniotic tissue, the the postnatal tissue graph, is completely immune privileged, right? So you can't have an allergic reaction. To the tissue graph we use now you could have an allergic reaction to part of that if you were using corion there is there is you know five layers to to the, the amnion three layers to the corion some of its decidua which is a maternal tissue we don't use that because that can provoke an allergic reaction but the amniotic cells or the umbilical cord tissue is uniquely capable of secreting huge volumes. They're very prolific, but they're stupid, right? So they secrete the same thing. Now, umbilical cord tissue is not stupid in that it is, because it goes back and forth, it doesn't leave the umbilical cord. It, these cells go back and forth. You know, one, it's like, a, it's like that old Chinese finger trap where you put both fingers and push and pull, and you can only get your fingers out one way, right? But that cell does the same thing. It kind of goes back and forth. And when it's on the maternal side, it secretes what mommy needs at that phase. And as it goes closer to the baby, it secretes what the baby needs. But those cells within the umbilical cord are uniquely pluripotential, meaning they can secrete a lot, right? But they're not trying to become something else. They're an umbilical cord stem cell. That their job is to secrete everything that the, that the mother and baby need. And so that tissue graft and it doesn't, like, you don't remodel the amnion and those cells become part of the baby and some of those cells. It's, it, it was created. That is the graph that we would want to help augment your bone marrow. And, and, and we've had this discussion because I've said many times and for, the, for a decade that the amnion is kind of like this worker bee cell. It's like having a bunch of 17-year-old kids help you move. Right? That used to be my best analogy because, you know, if you're... Like, in, and I'm not all 17 year olds are morons, but I was at 17. And, and I, but I was a big kid. And you know what? If I was helping my dad or some adult move, I would be the one who had to carry all the furniture out of the house. But you didn't want the 17 year old stack in the truck, or you had to make three trips because we weren't putting all the pieces together. I was big, box heavy, me lift, right? Like, that's kind of what, what I used to think oh, that was all Amnion did. And bone marrow, you know, th it's the one that turns the table upside down and it stacks the mattress this way and it knows how to stack the chairs. So I can get everything in one truck, but I don't want to be the one empty in the house or the brick mason thing where the 80 year old brick mason making this beautiful arch. If I'm doing that at 80 by myself, it may, it may not get done in a day. But if I have a couple 17 year olds with wheelbarrows 
I'll get a lot more done because I'm not doing all the heavy lifting, right? And that's how I thought amnion and bone marrow work together. And it's more important than that. Because now what we know is amnion doesn't just give bone marrow all these prolific amount of peptides and proteins so it knows what to do with it. Bone marrow asserts an effect on amnion because amnion can be not focused, but prolific. And bone marrow is kind of like, it's kind of like sitting by my dad in church when I was a kid. I may have had some attention problems and I've probably been hit in the back of the head with the Bible before to pay attention. It made me focused. And, and I, you know, yeah, right? Because I may have been distracted and he would instantly get me on target. That's kind of what bone marrow does to amnion. Focus, like help me, we need you to, I need you to do this. But what amnion does to bone marrow is bone marrow, we already talked about, it doesn't want to mobilize just to just do anything. So bone marrow, kind of, the amnion's kind of like having a little kid get dad off the couch to go play. Come on, dad, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And bone marrow's like, I don't really, like this isn't that important to me, mm -hmm. right? And bone marrow, amnion makes it get off the sofa and go outside and play, right? So amnion makes bone marrow do more, bone marrow makes amnion straighten up. That's the best analogy I can come up with, but it's a lot more complicated than that. But really, those cell interaction is how could I augment your tissue to do a better job? Amnion in and of itself may not know the target. It, now, is it going to give you a better chance of healing? Just some injections of, of a really, uh, of a significant undifferentiated cellular volume. Sure. Is the side effect profile of that really low because those cells you can't have an allergic reaction to? Yeah. Right. So it can help you heal better. But if we're going to try to form a new tendon, if we're going to try to heal a cuff, if we're going to try to, to heal a disc in a bat, we don't use a lot of just standalone postnatal tissue graft products because I don't think it's as honed in on the healing process and it's not your cells. And so I think that they may not be able to finish the job, but I think that your own marrow, especially if I'm 80 year old, like I may not, I mean, I may not have enough cells to get the job done and my cells are going to peter out a little bit before it's done. And with postnatal tissue graft, I'm, in our clinic with over 3000 cases now, I am, I'm way more likely to understand that I can kind of push healing to the finish line a little bit if I augment what your cells could do. Now there's a couple of ways to do that. You can do more than one injection. You can come back and be retreated because you're going to see some healing, but maybe you didn't heal enough, but you're going to see some. But I think that in our clinic, it's kind of turned into one and done and see how you do. And, and, and most, even in the interdiscal injections we've done, we have, we haven't read, we've redone two discs and one of them was an ultra marathoner five years out that wants to run hundred miles. And it wasn't that he redid the disc because it didn't work. He redid the disc because he did so well, but he wanted to jump and get ahead of retreatment because he started having that same little prodrome of inflammatory load with his run. And on MRI, he did have a little bit more inflammatory load there. And he almost had to hold my head underwater to get me to redo it, to redo it. Cause I, I wanted to see if it would heal, but he had a big race coming up. He didn't want to miss. I, I only have six months to train. So we did it. There's another lady we've redone on the same level who was in her eighties and she has a big slip. She did great for a couple of years. She had a significant injury in her fall, started having the same kind of pain on MRI. She does have a, a little bit of an annular tear again, even though she had an MRI that showed her annular tear at heel. And we redid that. But out of all the discs we've done in the clinic, we've, re we've, we've injected the same disc twice. Where we've re-injected people, where I think Amnion has done well, is if someone just has, they've had a bunch of surgery, they have a lot of intradural scarring, and with the Amnion and their prolific ability to secrete these anti-inflammatory peptides and proteins, you can do an epidural, break loose a lot of that tissue without provoking a big inflammatory response. Now, the problem with that is you the, the, you still have a really small canal. Like a lot of these people have bad stenosis, which we used to not even treat stenotic patients. They get heaviness and weakness in their legs. You have lumbar stenosis. And I because I didn't understand, like I won't use a graph for a treatment of a problem if I don't understand the physiology of how it would work. Like I'm not going to say, people say, well, can you just inject cells in it? Well, we can't. Do, do I think it's always a good idea? No, I mean, I want to understand, like, how could it help you heal that, Yeah. right? If there's a good path for it to help you heal it, and I and we understand the physiology, what these cells secrete, and I know that if I get those peptides and proteins there, you could do better, 
especially on the anti-inflammatory load of a stenosis patient now, which now I feel I get it. When we do an epidural in that area and patients see a prolific response, the heaviness and weakness, but it kind of wears off. If we have an 87 year old guy we've done like once a year for four or five years now, because it makes a difference for about a year, year and a half. And then that symptom starts coming back because those cells in the anti-inflammatory effect they gave you, you still have this really small canal. You still have all that post-op bony mass around it. You still don't have enough room. And rather than have a big surgery, take all that make it more room because that doesn't necessarily make you heal. And this person isn't healthy enough to have that done anyway. He, he wants to re-inject it and, and he does really well. And the reason you know he does really well is because insurance doesn't pay for that. It's not a Medicare procedure. And he's paid out of his pocket five or six times now to have it done because it made a huge difference for about a year at a time. He taught me about the problem because I didn't want to do it. He, he had done really well with the back pain part of we injected disc. He did really well with the back pain part, but then he started having weakness in his legs again and he wanted the epidural we done and he was right. Now I understand the pathogenesis of the process and we have a way of treating that inflammatory load with postnatal tissue graft. So bone marrow and amnion together. Now, are these fetal stem cells? No. What, what's the saying you guys have heard me say a million times? Healthy, healthy mommy, mommy, healthy baby, baby, healthy membrane, all three genetically tested for safety and infection. Like we wouldn't even, like there's only about, you know, less than 11% of the graph passes the, the, the sterility measures, mm -hmm. let alone the genetic testing. Before genetic testing, would I feel comfortable using a lot of postnatal tissue graft in someone? Mm -hmm. No. I didn't even feel comfortable using a lot of allograft tendon before, before you could make sure there wasn't protein contamination in it. Like there's some really tragic things that have happened with, with tissue transfers and with graft from another allograft, meaning from another human to take it to you. There's a, a there's a significant rejections and in, in fungal infections. There was one cadaver out of New Mexico a long time ago that contaminated like gave gave like 30 people a fungal infection because the labs then didn't have a way to test for fungal contamination. Just because the culture didn't grow anything didn't mean it didn't have a fungal infection. Now all the graft is genetically tested, is tested for Fungal contamination is tested for, we can show that it doesn't even have the gene for cancer someday, right? And we can prove no DNA contamination, which is it possible with post tissue graft? No. There's a lot, and, and we haven't even talked about yet, when people talk about getting stem cells and going to Panama mm -hmm. or going to Columbia or going to- The Caymans. The Ca so the Cayman, now the Cayman is a little different because most of the graph he uses there is autologous. I mean, they're taking marrow and culturally expanding. Um, and why are the labs so different there in those places than here? They, they have a law. It's not that the labs are different. A lot of that tissue graph is made here, but it's the law in the, in the United States is you get the representation that you pay for, right? The political narrative against fetal tissue was from a political candidate who was rallying the truth. And you know, the way the parties do it, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna give either party a shout out. The way the parties do it is they're the same guy. Like they're paying, you know, nothing makes you as mad as watching, if you're mad at someone in a, in a legal battle, which I had a pretty significant legal battle, with a previous partner that had us that with a stem pretty look, I'd been to Panama. I've got cells there. I took my sister there. A couple times. Yeah. Long time ago. Because it was the one of the only models out there that allowed for a culturally expanded postnatal tissue graph. We're not allowed to culturally expand tissue in the US. Can we give postnatal tissue graph in the US? Yeah. Do we have to, is it a doctor patient conversation or a doctor doctor conversation? Yes, because the FDA again controls commerce, the narrative. This is all theoretical opinion. We need to say right now, this is my medical opinion based on my feelings about graft. Is it, do, is this stuff that I would even look other than being a patient? Are there certain conversations I can't have with you on this podcast? Mike, 
Want to weigh in on that? <laughs> Mike's the handler if anybody hasn't picked up on it yet. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it's absolutely true. There is doctor-patient confidentiality, yeah. right? What, what's said behind a closed door of a patient room is, is strictly involving that physician with their patient. And if I'm examining a patient and the patient is informed, are we allowed to make some decisions without the FDA being involved in the direct care and management of a patient. In theory, yes. In theory. Yes. And if I'm in an operating room, is the FDA tell me what to do in surgery because it's against the law to practice medicine if you're not a doctor. It's impersonating a physician. You have to be a physician under federal law to practice medicine. Now, I think that a lot of politicians, a lot of drug companies aren't doctors. And they practice medicine. Yeah. I think a lot of advertising agencies, but they control the narrative. Technically, they're not touching a patient because they're not licensed to touch a patient. Just like my ex-partner wasn't licensed to touch a patient mm -hmm. and never touched a patient and has never injected someone. Doctor, right? But I'm a doctor, like a real doctor, like a surgeon, like med school, yeah. like <laughs> four years of medical school, a year of general surgery rotating internship, an orthopedic residency, and then a trauma fellowship. I'm a doctor. You're qualified to be there. So so if I'm sitting in an <laughs> exam room yeah. with a patient, does mm -hmm. anyone else get to tell me how to treat that patient? No, the patient gets to make those decisions. And my job is to help them make the best decision possible. Yeah. We can talk about what all your options are that we're allowed to do in the US. Can I use culturally expanded amnion in the US? No, and we don't. Are there some countries they can use culturally expanded amnion IV to treat systemic illnesses? Yes. Do I think that's a great idea? I certainly think it has potential. Yeah. I think there's 15 years of published data <laughs> that show it can make a really big difference for a lot of people. I think that, that the, here's the problem though, the science behind a lot of that graph that started in 05 in Costa Rica and then, you know, moved to Panama and then, you know, offshoots end up in Colombia and, um, you know, graph used in, in, in other countries. And I don't want to give them a bunch of specific shout out to the, all the different clinics out there. Um, but, but there's, it's not hard to find that out. Um, when I go to Mexico for culturally expanded, let's talk about different types of stem cell, right? Why are stem cells controversial? Because we're given one label to 20 different things. Mm. Actually, we're given one label to hundreds of different things. Mm. Yeah. Because even within your bone marrow, hundreds of different types of stem cells, mm. right? Well, before we venture outside the US, right? Exosomes. We keep hearing this exosome word, and, and I always have patients, and I know Hannah gets it all the time. Well, how many cells? You've heard me describe an exosome by about 20 different terms. Microvesicles of support, the secretome of the cell, mm -hmm. um, microvessels, uh, growth factors, secretory proteins. What exosome particle was it? How what cells did it? they come mm -hmm. from? How big of what did they? Because there are a lot of people that cheat. We should focus on just making people as healthy as we can get them. The cell would seem like exosomes may not be that important because again, we don't even know what they're calling next cell. But tecron. number, and, and yeah, tecron, and yeah, number of cells may not even be that important. 